again and welcome back. In the previous lecture, we were looking at the surprising foundations in history of the creation evolution debate, and in particular, Sir Charles Lyell's highly influential book, Principles of Geology. As I previously mentioned, Lyell spent himself traveling the world, looking for evidence to back up his new history. One of those places visited was Niagara Falls in 1841. If you ever get the chance to visit the Niagara Falls, I highly recommend it. You can notice several significant things. Take the journey behind the falls, which are tunnels at the bottom of the falls and in behind. Besides spectacular scenery, when you are at the base of the falls, look in behind the falling water. Notice there is a bit of a cave forming behind the falls. Now there's a couple of different kinds of rock involved here. There is a limestone layer at the top and shale at the bottom. Limestone is a fairly tough rock. It is actually the rock from which we get concrete. So think of it like concrete. The shale is a very soft, fine-grained sediment which has basically been compacted together into a rock. It's quite weak. In fact, you can often pull it apart with your bare hands. What is happening at the falls is that the tougher layer of limestone forms the ledge over which the water flows. As the water hits the bottom, the force of the water and spray erodes away the very soft layers of shale underneath the limestone, making the cavern. Eventually, a large enough cavern forms underneath the limestone that the limestone can no longer support itself and the roof of the cavern collapses. As the falls continuously move backwards upstream towards Lake Erie, the Niagara Gorge is left behind. The falls and gorge started here at the Niagara Escarpment. So when Lyell visited the falls, ye old gears in his head must have been turning. Here was the perfect clock that he could call upon. A modern day, observable, repeatable process that he could call upon in his book to bolster his new history. You know, get an idea of how slowly the falls are moving backward over time measure the length of the gourd and extrapolate the age of the gorge by dividing the length of the gorge by the erosion rate. So, in the name of proper and good science, did he study and measure the erosion rates over time you know, to get a good handle on the erosion rate? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, no, no, no. He instead asked the locals what they thought. Now, he did find one man who told him, well, I've been eyeballing a tree from this side to that tree on the other side of the gorge, and I'd estimated probably it'd be eroding at about, oh, three feet per year. So, did Lyell use the locals' wild guess in his book? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, no, no, no. That simply would not serve his secret purposes of refuting the biblical history in the minds of people and replacing history with his story. No, he assumed the local was exaggerating and wrote that the falls were eroding at one foot per year. From there, it was simple math. He wrote that a 35,000 foot gorge eroding at one foot per year was 35,000 years old and the earth could not possibly be 6,000 years old. You see, everyone in Lyell's day knew that, according to the biblical account, the earth was only around six to 10,000 years old. So Lyell once again put his cunning lawyer's tactic to use in his writing about the Niagara Gorge. He never mentioned the Bible. He simply used a modern day process in claiming that the gorge was 35,000 years old and the earth couldn't possibly be 6,000 years old. Everyone who read Lyell's book knew what he had just done. He flat out refuted the Bible, even though he never mentioned it. So whose erosion estimate was right? Lyell's or the local man who claimed three feet per year? Well, as it turns out, neither. When actual true science was conducted and the erosion rates were actually measured, the rates were discovered to be closer to five feet per year. 
Lyell convinced countless numbers of people around the world that this book was fiction, when in fact it was his science that was fiction. You could not even call Lyell's research flawed because he didn't do any research. His report was dishonest at best. He asked the locals their opinions, and then in gross anti-science procedure, he even tossed out what information he did gather and replaced it with his own numbers that he felt bolstered his story. And he, had he accurately reported using actual erosion rates of the day, his extra extrapolation would have placed an age of about 7,000 years old on the gorge. It would have been seen by readers as affirming the biblical history. But it gets worse. Well, worse for Lyell and his new history of deep time. Back in 2006, I was on a speaking tour in the U.S. and was coming back to Canada. I called up my good friend Ian Taylor, author of the phenomenal book In the Minds of Men. I had intended to stop in to visit him as his home was in Ontario and on the way back to mine. Uh, he got all excited and said, I'm so glad you called. I was just going to call you. You see, just that day, this historic drawing of Niagara Falls had just been reprinted in the newspaper. This is acknowledged as the first ever drawing of Niagara Falls, drawn by Father Louis Hennepin in 1678. I was in Ohio at the time, and Ian faxed me a copy of this drawing. He had the brilliant idea of seeing if we could figure out from where Hennepin was when he made this drawing. Now, it's a very disorienting drawing at first, uh, here's the Horseshoe Falls, and then what today is known as the American Falls, an island in the middle. I'll elaborate on that island in a second, because previously I, and just about everyone else, had assumed that this was the modern-day Goat Island. Obviously, this would have been drawn from the New York side of the gorge. So I set out with facts in hand to Niagara Falls, New York, and within 15 minutes I had pinned down where I think Hennepin was when he made this drawing. It was obvious. The catch is, the Knights of Columbus beat me to it. Look at this. The exact same location, a hundred years before I got there in 1910, the Knights of Columbus had placed a stone monument honoring their priest and his drawing of the falls, which would become the first ever published drawing of the Niagara Falls. So why did the Knights of Columbus and myself come to the exact same conclusion? I mean, look at it. Currently, you can't even see the falls from this location. In fact, most historians have written off Hennepin's drawing as exaggerated and drawn years after the fact from memory. Hogwash! <laughs> The only reason they say that is because the falls in Hennepin's drawing do not look anything like they do today. That is an El Lamo excuse to reject the accuracy of this drawing, especially considering the volume of water flowing through the river was at least double today's volume, and the drawing was made over 340 years ago. Of course it's going to look different. Furthermore, the drawing contains too many accuracies in the gorge to have been drawn by memory. No, he drew it on location, and that is precisely why the Knights of Columbus and myself came to the exact same conclusion on the location. There are major landmarks in the drawing which are still there today. Notice on the Canadian side, this curve, sharp curve in the shoreline with a large rock outcrop, and a landing down below, there is trails where people can venture down. And then this point over on the American side, this prominent point almost straight across the gorge and slightly downstream from the landing, also notice that the island separating the two waterfalls is long, narrow, and pointing almost straight down the gorge. In the second edition of my Complete Creation series, uh, I made the same mistake everybody else did, and I labeled that island as what we now know as Goat Island. 
But Goat Island is way farther upstream in Hennepin's drawing. And it is more at a right angle to the gorge, not almost parallel to it. I'll revisit this island repeatedly, but for the moment, just notice its position, direction, shape, and form. This point in the drawing is prospect point. Now, I should, it should be noted that the original prospect point was quite a bit larger and more prominent. It collapsed in the 1950s and as seen here is reconstructed to look like the original. It was a prominent vista from which visitors could enjoy the falls. On the Canadian side, here's the shoreline curve in the river with the prominent rock outcrop. It's right above a major landing, which today is from where they launch the Hornblower tourist boats. Then accordingly, this is where the rim of the falls was during Hennepin's visit. Now, from about the 1950s on, the erosion rates of the Niagara Gorge have been effectively zero. There are multiple reasons for this. As much as 80% of the flow of the Niagara River has been diverted around the falls for hydroelectric projects, the Welland Canal, and the Erie Canal. The International Niagara Parks Commission has also actively buttressed and reinforced all rock walls to counter any erosion. So if the falls at Hennepin's time were right here, and we measure to the nearest edge of the modern day falls, it's about 3,400 feet. So from Hennepin's time to 1950, when the erosion was basically halted, you have about 270 years. 3,400 feet divided by 270 years gives us over 12 and a half feet of erosion per year. But if we go by the furthest point of erosion on the Horseshoe Falls today, depending on how and where you measure, it's actually about 4,000 to 4,500 feet. That calculates out to as much as 15 to 16 and a half feet per year. Now, one might say my assumptions are on shaky ground. My assumption that Hennepin's drawing is accurate and that we can estimate erosion rates based on that drawing. But you see, that's the thing. Charles Lyell had absolutely zero excuse to A, not conduct actual scientific measurements of erosion rates, or B, to not include the measurements that had already been conducted. That's right. There was plenty of data around decades before Lyell ever came along. This map was the first ever actual map produced by a survey. It was compiled by the amazing Andrew Ellicott in 1790. 51 years before Lyell ever showed up on the scene and 112 years after Hennepin's now famous drawing. His survey did not include scale and his surveys and maps were based on longitude and latitude. However, this map is still very enlightening. Notice the island, which parts the falls, parts the two falls, it's long and narrow, pointing only slightly away from due north and almost parallel with the gorge. This is in stark contrast to the modern day Goat Island, which is a wide island whose longitudinal axis runs almost due east-west. Ellicott's map lines up with Hennepin's drawing, quite remarkably. Also bear in mind, at this time, the volume of water flowing over the falls was at least two to perhaps five times the modern day volume and possibly more. As a result, there was radical changes in the shorelines as could be seen when you comparing Ellicott's map to the modern day riverbed. Also notice that Ellicott has Fort Schlosser marked on his map. Fort Schlosser provided the upstream docks for the portage around the falls. The portage trails went from Fort Schlosser to Fort Niagara on the shores of Lake Ontario. This was such a well-traveled portage and these forts were built, well, and they were both so significant that there is, of course, maps of the forts and trails. 
such as this one by Gogerman, compiled in 1788, 53 years before Lyell ever showed up on the scene. Notice that Gogerman also draws that parting island as long, narrow, and at about a 45 degree angle to the gorge and due north much more in alignment with Hennepin's drawing from 110 years prior. Gotherman did try to draw his map to scale, and while his focus was the portage and not the river or gorge, he does show the gorge as maybe 31,500 feet long. Compare that to the same measured path in Google Earth of about 37,000 feet. That places the falls during Gotherman and Ellicott's time some 5,500 feet downstream from the current location of the falls. This certainly lines up with my estimates based on Hennepin's drawing, but it gets better. In the January 1751 issue of Gentleman's Magazine, a Swedish man by the name of Peter Kalm writes of his experience and travels to the Great Niagara Falls. 90 years before Lyell ever visited the falls. Calm also provided a drawing, which again, many historians poo-pooed as just being a stylized reproduction of Hennepin's drawing, which they claim was exaggerated and drawn from memory. Uh, what is it with you historians making this claim? Did you not read the article? Calm even disparaged Hennepin in the article and he drew the falls with details he included in his story. Details like the ladder that the two stranded Indians made trying to get off of the island in the middle of the falls after getting stranded there for days. It shows the major landmarks I pointed out in the Hennepin drawing. Prospect Point. The curve in the river now downstream now just downstream from the Horseshoe Falls, with its prominent rock outcrop, the major landing at the bottom, and even trails for people to venture down to the landing. Notice also the island is long and narrow and it curves slightly and runs virtually parallel to the gorge downstream from the falls. All the drawings and maps of that time period show the exact same thing. Yes, it's radically different than modern times, but the conventional thinking has skewed your perceptions and assumptions. Calm's drawing even matches his very detailed written description, which radically differs from the modern form. For example, the breadth of the fall as it runs in a semicircle is reckoned to be about six arpents. The island is in the middle of the fall, and from it to each side is almost the same breadth. The breadth of the island at its end is two-thirds of an arpent, or thereabouts. The face of the island, being maybe 130 feet wide or so, is a far, far cry from the very wide face of Goat Island, which is currently some 1,800 feet wide. That island in the drawings is not Goat Island, but rather... Luna Island. Luna Island has long since been eroded away and is now but a small, insignificant rock in the river. Goat Island at that time was in all likelihood submerged under the raging Niagara River. Goat Island was probably an insignificant rock if it was even peaking up above the river waters. Remember, the water volume of the Niagara River was magnitudes higher at the time. In a letter to the editor of Nature magazine, April 2nd of 1891, Edward G. Bourne revisited the history of using the Niagara Gorge as a clock. A fascinating read that I would highly recommend. He mentions a Mr. Garbett who was trying to identify the island mentioned by Calm in Gentleman's magazine. Bourne wrote, Mr. Garbett tries to identify an island that Calm mentions as intersecting the falls as Luna Islet. This would give a definite point for calculation. It seems to me that an attempt to test Mr. Garbett's conjecture by the Evershed map must show that it is untenable. If I have understood him and correctly measured in accordance with the suggestions, 
the recession of the Canadian Falls will have been about half a mile in the 133 years, or about 20 feet a year. Notwithstanding Calm's small dimensions, I think he meant Goat Island, for he says the island lies parallel with the river and Luna Islet prolonged would lie at almost right angles to the river at its lower end. That is all exactly what I'm trying to show here. Luna Island is the island that divided the falls, and yes, it would lie at almost right angles to the upper river at its lower end, but almost parallel to the river in the gorge. He did not mean Goat Island. And yes, the erosion rates were magnitudes higher in the past. Notice how Bourne's estimate of 20 feet per year is not too far off my proposed my proposal of almost 17 feet per year. But he rejects it as untenable. Why was this so unbelievable to him? The geology of the Niagara Gorge would affirm all of this. In fact, the geology shows erosion rates magnitudes higher than even these huge numbers. First of all, erosion rates by water volume are exponential. We know the river volume was at least two times higher in the past than today's rates because we diverted 50% 50, 50 to 80% of the water of volume around the falls. If you double the flow volume of a river, erosion rates increase by four times or more. This does not take into account the possibility of extremely high flow rates in the ancient past because of the meltback of Ice Age glaciers, which could have produced a dramatic increase in water volume. If you visit the Falls and Gorge today, and I highly recommend you do so, you can actually see the different rock types in the layering exposed in the gorge. The hard and tough limestone layer at the falls is considerably thicker than it is immediately downstream from the falls. The softer shales thicken considerably while the limestone thins. So the falls would have eroded the gorge at far faster rates than the modern rates measured in the 40s because the water would have had way thinner limestone to work and far more of the softer shales to erode. Furthermore, as you go downstream, the gorge makes some unusual turns. At one turn, the gorge narrows dramatically. It's so narrow, you almost feel as if you could throw rocks from one country to the other. Uh, don't do that. We're currently at peace with one another. The rapids are quite dramatic here, and on the Canadian side is the boardwalk. I highly recommend visiting the boardwalk. This narrow gorge ends at the Whirlpool, where the gorge takes a dramatic right-hand turn. What on earth happened here? Why does the gorge take a right-hand turn? Rivers don't just randomly take right-hand turns. This question was answered in 1924 with the construction of the Michigan Central Railway Bridge. When they tried to put in the pilings for the bridge foundation, they didn't hit solid rock. What they did hit was dirt and for quite a ways down. What they had discovered was a previously excavated gorge, which is now known as the St. David's Gorge. So before the formation of the Niagara Gorge, a river had previously cut a gorge, probably before the Ice Age. The gorge was then filled in with dirt, glacial till. Presumably when the ice sheets from the Ice Age melted back and the Niagara River began to flow from Lake Erie over the Niagara Escarpment and into Lake Ontario, the river started carving the new Niagara Gorge. It carved the gorge upstream until it met the previously cut St. David's Gorge, now filled up with loose sand and small rocks. It would have flushed all that dirt out of the gorge virtually overnight. When Ontario Hydro constructed the Sir Adam Beck Generating Station, it diverted a massive amount of water from the Niagara River above the falls to just above the Niagara Escarpment. They diverted the water through canals and tunnels, 
But when they encountered the buried St. David's Gorge, they had to bring all of that water to the surface and build concrete lined flumes. Otherwise, the water would have just washed away the sand from the now buried gorge and they'd lose all of their water. The St. David's Gorge comprised some 6,100 feet of the 37,000 foot Niagara Gorge. So about one sixth of the entire length of the Niagara Gorge was probably excavated in days. Erosion rates of hundreds of feet per day is not at all an unreasonable suggestion. Lyell was without excuse for what he published in his book that misled countless numbers into discounting this book as a literal history book and embracing his fictitious story of deep time. Now you can call Lyell's work and writings anything you want, as long as you don't use words like good work, accurate, scientific, or honest. Lyell deliberately, and I dare would say deceitfully, convinced countless numbers that this book was fiction, when in fact it was Lyell's book that was fiction, and consequently the deep time beliefs. The Niagara Gorge, if used as a uniformitarian clock, actually affirms the biblical timeline as the gorge is demonstrably very young. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. The most important fossil that we will focus on here is the numerous fossil trees buried upright. These are what caught Lyell's attention the most. As you can see, these trees are buried vertically. If those rock layers equal millions of years as we are taught, you've got a real problem here. You can catch this entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the shows online at completecreation.org or genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep the program on the air. Please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North, Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support. Mm -hmm.